question for today is this. Where is our greatest chance for success? Let's talk a little bit about David's life and put the text in context next. The time of 1 Chronicles 17 through 20 matches 2 Samuel 7 through 10. David in Jerusalem makes an interesting request of God. He wants to build a palace for God called a temple. After all, David now has a palace in Jerusalem in an up-and-coming city in the ancient world. Well, the Ark of God remains in a tent, and David sees that and somehow feels there's wrong in that. Uh, personally, I think David's conscience was bothering him a bit because he was so successful. After all, if a tent was good enough for God, then why make a tabernacle? Well, God, of course, refused David's request. David accepts the reality of his little bit of materialism, which would plague him even at the end of his kingdom and spill over into his son, Solomon. But David does do good. One fascinating little hint from the scholarly world in 1 Chronicles 18, the scribes call chief officials there, but in 2 Samuel, they're called priests. Now, this is interesting. You see, the Bathsheba and Uriah episode took place between 1 Chronicles 20, verse 1, and 20, verse 2. Now, isn't it interesting how the priests were content to forgive David's failure? It wasn't an attempt to whitewash the event by any means. Just that to the priest, David had took his punishment and made his atonement. The priests see no purpose in gossiping about leadership. Gossiping about leadership is a shameful form of entertainment we enjoy even today. Our Bible IQ question, what were the figureheads on the ship that took Paul from Malta to Italy? Was it Mercury and Venus, Mars and Jupiter, Arcaster and Pollock? Later we'll give you the answer if you don't already know it. According to 2 Chronicles 2, verse 17, King Solomon pulled off the largest forced labor movement under the direction of one kingdom. Solomon counted the number of people who were not Israelites in his kingdom and made them slaves. He seized 153,600 slaves and divided their work up into three areas. 70,000 were forced into the transportation of heavy rock and materials for construction. 80,000 he put in the strip mining operations, and 3,600 he made supervise these workers. Solomon also bore heavy taxes on the people of Israel to finance his large and magnificent building projects. This is a book that we have just written called Divorce, and it's called Divorce or Why God Hates Divorce, but not the divorce. Now, I want you to have it if you know someone who's gone through a broken marriage or perhaps has gone through a separation or a betrayal. It's an important book for you to have, the book on divorce. What does God's Word say about it? There are 36 scriptures in the Bible concerning the matter of divorce. Is remarriage permitted? All of those questions we deal with in this book called Why God Hates Divorce, but not the divorce. To receive the book, you need to write to us. You've got to ask for it. And when you write, please keep in mind we're viewer supported. That simply means, beloved, that we need your continued support for us to keep this ministry going. So take a moment, write today, send your best gift. Be sure and ask for the book on divorce. We'll send it to you. Life Lessons, Box 2000, Goodyear, Arizona, 85338. Some interesting things to consider from the quick study by Guide. When Edmonton McHenry returned to his Avery Island home in Louisiana at the end of the Civil War, he found little left of his family's plantation. Casting around for a way to survive, McHenry focused on a patch of red pepper plants. He chopped them up and he mixed them with Avery Island salt. Then he set the mash into aged oak barrels. The result? Tabasco sauce. His descendants are still making 180,000 bottles of Tabasco sauce every day on Avery Island. Well, David found that with God, defeat never had to be permanent. It seemed as though David had been defeated for so many years. 
well, at least his victories were delayed because Saul had pursued him and tried to kill him and David and his whole family were in exile for a number of years. We come to this point in David's life and we now begin to see where it turns around. Rather than defeat, he begins to have victory after victory after victory. But he wasn't an overnight success. And that's a great thing for us to keep in mind too, beloved, is that the faithfulness that we exhibit before God as we walk toward him builds toward the time of reward or victory or prosperity. But we've got to spend the time in the school of God's spirit, being disciplined, learning how to handle the vicissitudes of life for us to finally be successful. Before we get into some of the victories that David experienced, let's look into God's word. Here is God's precious word. David took the gold shields carried by the officers of Hadadzer and brought them to Jerusalem. From Teba and Kun, towns that belonged to Hadadzer, David took a great quantity of bronze, which Solomon used to make the bronze sea, the pillars, and various bronze articles. When too, king of Amath heard that David had defeated the entire army of the Hadadzer, king of Zobah, he sent his son Hadarim to King David to greet him and congratulate him on his victory in battle over Hadazer, who had been at war with To. Hadarim brought all kinds of articles of gold and silver and bronze. King David dedicated these articles to the Lord, as he had done with the silver and gold he had taken from all these nations, Edom and Moab, the Ammonites and the Philistines and the Amalek. Abishai, son of Zeruiah, struck down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He put garrisons in Edom, and all the Edomites became subject to David. The Lord gave David victory everywhere he went. 1 Chronicles 18, verses 7 through 13. God gave David victory everywhere that he went. Keep in mind. That was only after years of delay, defeat, obedience to God, prayer, all of those things that David had done led up to this great time of harvest. We have six life lessons we're going to draw from our portion of scripture today, as is our normal method. Let's look at the first, here it is. Victories come in God's time. David didn't defeat all his enemies at once. Rather, victory came in God's time. Remember, we had talked about Israel when they were coming out of the wilderness, going into the promised land. God told Joshua, he said, you're not going to take the land all at once because there are wild beasts there. If you took the land all at once, you couldn't handle it wild beasts would overcome you and various other things would occur. But little by little, I'm going to give you the land. Now, beloved, that's how success in the kingdom comes. It isn't all at once. The fact is, too little, too late is bad, but also too much too soon is bad. God knows exactly when to give us the success that we can handle if we always pray, not my will, but thy will be done. That's why the proverbist said, Lord, don't make me so poor that I steal, but don't make me so rich that I forget you. Feed me with food convenient for me. And that was the attitude of David. David didn't want anything God didn't want him to have, but he wanted everything God did want him to have. And that's the attitude, beloved, that you and I need to adopt. Now, a second thing that we learn is that David began to conquer all of these enemies of God in the land of Canaan, or the land of Palestine. And the kingdoms of this world began to be the kingdoms of God. That's the life lessons. The kingdoms of this world can become the kingdoms of our Christ. Now, the Moabites bring tribute to Israel. The Moabites, for many years, had been opposing Israel and hostile to Israel. But now, these people who, uh, by and large, were pagan people, 
began to pay tribute to Israel. God knows how to make the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Christ. And one day when Jesus returns, that's going to happen in fullness. And we're going to see that all of the world's riches will be our Lord's. And it will be obvious that they are the riches, they are the Lord's. Notice, it talked about how that God gave David victory wherever he went. Here's a life lesson, beloved. God gives us victories everywhere we go with him. David had a string of victories as he faithfully followed God. We've got to keep that in mind. As we are obedient to the Lord, we will be victorious. Remember it was said of, uh, of Uzziah, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. You see, when we walk with God, then we conquer what God wants us to conquer. But it's when we begin to look for ourself and not for the kingdom of God that we get into trouble. David takes the spoils of war, the wealth of the unrighteous, and he now brings them back to Jerusalem. They are dedicated to God. Later, these spoils of war, like the bronze shields and various other things, will be melted down and will be used in the temple that Solomon is going to build after David's death. Here's our life lesson. God can use the wealth of the unrighteous. The bronze shields of the enemy are taken to form the temple basin. That's where the metal comes from. Notice, though, that whenever David conquered an enemy and took the spoils, the first thing that he did was dedicate those spoils to God. Now, remember in reading the life of David that before he ever went into battle, he always asked, God, do you want me to go into this battle? He didn't simply look over here and say, oh, that looks like a good land to conquer. I think I'll do it. He always asked God. So he was moving in the will of God. And then when he accomplished what God wanted him to accomplish, he brought the resources back and acknowledged that it was God who gave him the victory, and he dedicated those resources to God. Now, beloved, that's what we at Life Lessons must do. Our, our studio right here in Brampton, Ontario, our studio in uh, Goodyear, Arizona, everything that we have, every piece of equipment must daily be dedicated to God because it's his, not ours. Here's our life lesson. All our resources must be dedicated to God. David dedicated all the spoils of the battles to the Lord that he loved. Now, David was a, a good king, a godly king, because you see, he did what was good for God and what was good for others, not for himself. If you go back to Saul, and one of the reasons why Saul is not mentioned very much in the book of Chronicles, is that Saul was a selfish man. When he was young and humble, God blessed him, but when he became proud and arrogant, he began to amass for himself, rather than wanting the will of God, he wanted what was best for him and his family. And God rejected him from being king. So here's our life lesson. Good men do what is good for others. David did not live selfishly. Rather, he did what was good for all of Israel. That's what the scripture says. It's so easy, beloved, for us when we get to a position of power, prominence, prestige, prosperity, for us to forget that it is God who brought us there and that we have an obligation to others. One of my favorite characters was the the black scientist, George Washington Carver. I admired that man so deeply because he was such a great, great man. Probably no person in history do I admire more than George Washington Carver. And uh, one day he was offered a lot of money if he would leave his place at Tuskegee Institute and, and go and work for this big corporation. And the man said, look what you could do with all that money. And he said, I'm afraid I would forget my people if I had all of that. So he rejected all of that money and stayed working for his black people. What a man he was. Well, David had the same spirit. He worked for what was good for the people. Here is our application from what we have learned today. Although David was far from perfect, he was a man after God's own heart. Because of this passion, God gave him great victories. You see, beloved, God blesses what he possesses. 
as we walk with God daily, we will experience great victories. The enemy of our soul is put underfoot. I hope that we will have the same attitude, that we won't try to amass for ourselves power, prestige, prominence, prosperity, but we will recognize that God has called us to be a spokesman for Him. And being a spokesman for Him involves caring for the needs of other people, not for our own selfish wants, not being so preoccupied with amassing so that we can live an easy retirement, but that we might faithfully do His work, trusting God to take care of us when we get to retirement. Let us keep that in mind, if we will. into the life and times of 2 Kings. In Megiddo, during the time of Ahab, worship to the Baal cult gods required the repugnant and tragic sacrifice of human babies. Uncovered in 1924 at the ancient site of Megiddo, ritual jars containing the burned bones of infants. This area was the famous battlefield in 2 Kings, where all the major confrontations between good and evil took place. Armageddon, a name associated with the great final battle of the ages, is the plains of Megiddo. No greater horrors of human nature or triumphs of spiritual victory have been accomplished than on the historical site of Megiddo. This is a book I really want you to have. It's called Why God Hates Divorce But Not the Divorced. If you know someone who's gone through divorce, separation, betrayal, I want you to have the book. It will help you understand what God's Word says about divorce, about remarriage, and so on. Now remember, any time that you write, we always put you on the list so that you get this publication regularly. This publication accompanies our program. It's called the Quick Study Pocket Guide. So if you will write, you'll be sure and get the divorce book if you ask for it, and also you will automatically receive publication called the quick study pocket guide will you write today when you write remember that we are viewer supported that simply means that we need your continued help to stay on the air and i want to thank you for your wonderful faithfulness in keeping us here here is the address life lessons box 2000 goodyear arizona 85338 take a moment write today if you will please why would he do it why would the King David, the mighty King of Israel, compare the supreme being of the universe, God Almighty, to a lowly shepherd? Robin helps us understand today in the Life Science segment, here she is. One of the most important occupations in the Bible was the shepherd. It is mentioned over 200 times throughout scripture. The Hebrew word for shepherd is often translated feeding and speaks of one of the many tasks of the shepherd. The life of a shepherd was difficult and often lonely. Since the livestock required constant care and daily food and water, the shepherd had to find water and pasture for his sheep. That meant the men of the family sometimes had to travel great distances and be away from the family for extended periods. The flock often included both sheep and goats. The shepherd had to drive the goats, but he led the sheep. Sheep were important for clothing, food, and sacrifices. Goats provided meat, milk, cheese, butter, and skins used for tents and containers. The shepherd not only provided food and water for the flock, but had to protect them as well. Predators of the flock included wolves, lions, bears, and panthers. Now these were known to live in Israel through the time of the monarchy. The shepherd also had to be on guard against thieves. The weapons of the shepherd included a sling, which was a pouch with two strings, into which a stone was placed and hurled at high speeds, and a club, often studded with metal or rocks. The shepherd became quite skilled in the use of these weapons. David was a shepherd before he became the king of Israel. It was on the lonely hillsides he honed his musical skill and came to know his God. David wrote Psalm 23 from his experience as a shepherd. It's one of the most beautiful passages of scripture. 
And it's not only an allegory of God's love and care for his children, but a practical description of the daily duties of the shepherd. In the Bible, a shepherd came to mean not only the one who herded sheep, but a word for the kings and leaders of Israel, and God himself. In the New Testament, there are several passages that use the relationship of shepherd and sheep to illustrate Christ's relationship with the church. In the early Christian church, Paul called the church the flock and the leader shepherds. The Latin word translated pastor actually means shepherd. Interesting analogy, yes. isn't it? Yes, it is. Are you ready now for the Bible? Yeah, this question? is a hard one today, but now, I think I know the answer. Here it is. The Bible IQ question today is a hard one. What were the figureheads on the ship that took Paul from Malta to Italy? Uh, was it Mercury and Venus, Mars and Jupiter, or Castor and Pollux? Castor and Pollux, number three. And uh, this is an interesting passage. And why they act, Luke actually mentions it, we're not real sure. But uh, it's uh, an allusion to perhaps the Roman mythology of the time. Ah, uh, that's very good. I'm proud of you, Rod. Well, I didn't do so good on the other, so I had to give a little <laughs> explanation there, you know. Let's go over to our video post. Today, Bill Wilson, one of our favorite people, is on video piece. post. Here it is. And welcome to the ghetto. You guys got the email? Yes. Do you know what address to yes. make sure I get the messages? At least every day so I know what's up. Okay, thanks. See you guys later. Bye. Well, I'm on my way to the Philippines today. This has been one of these hectic days, getting everything ready, everything moving. Many of you know, as we've, we've said, and I know you've heard, that there are branches of the Sunday School now going on literally all over the world. And I'm going today to follow up on the Sunday School in Manila where they're running almost 4,000 a week. And, uh, and it's been so exciting between Houston here, Dallas, Los Angeles, Detroit, um, Washington, D.C., Miami, and the list goes on and on. Folks, this ministry is built on principles, not on a personality. That's the excitement of this whole thing because it doesn't revolve around me. People come here from all over the world, all across the United States. They see what's going on here. They see the changed lives. They see how people are affected. And because of that, people are saying, we need this in our city. We need to duplicate this. We've got to make a difference in this generation where we live. And uh, hopefully when I get out to the Philippines, we're going to try to get a video camera. I don't know if we're going to be able to, but we're going to try. And I'm going to try to show you what's going on there and keep you updated, keep you posted on what's happening. So pray for me. I'm going to the airport now, and hopefully the next time I talk to you on this trip, it'll be from a Metro Sidewalk Sunday School site in Manila in a garbage dump because that's where some of those kids live. And that's where we started Sunday School. So pray for me as I go. Thank you again. I'll talk to you soon. God bless. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful what God is doing through Metro Ministries. Bill Wilson. Rod, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is Bill went somewhere that no one wanted to go and did something no one wanted to do. But it was where God took him. And now, just like David, he is experiencing great success. Mm because now these ministries are going all over the world. It's important, beloved, that we go where God wants us to go, do what God wants us to do, and we will see great victory. I think it's important to define success, too. I mean, Bill is not a wealthy person. He doesn't live in some big place, but success in the kingdom of God is reaching people and establishing relationships for his kingdom. That's Bill Wilson, a shepherd to the inner city. Well, why don't you pray for him, and why don't you send us your video post questions. Here is the address. Our time of truth today, there are no victories without conflicts, no rainbows without a cloud and a storm. Uh, in this segment, which we're dedicating to uh, our Bible group leaders, I just want to make a couple of comments and see if you could comment on them. Um, leadership, spiritual leadership, albeit in a Bible group or in a church, is a form of shepherding. We've been talking about David how he compared God to the shepherd. But uh, what is the role of a Bible group leader versus the role of a pastor, and how should they interact there? Well, I think that we have to respect our, I know we have to respect our pastors that God gives us. Pastoring is a very special calling, but uh, it is a shepherd in many ways. But a Bible study leader really shares God's word with two, three, four, 15, whatever, how many ever people God brings there. And 
shares God, God's word and helps them grow together in our Lord. That's his role. So in other words, it's not necessarily uh, negating the role oh, of a no, pastor, no. but a Bible group no. leader, because there are several kinds of ministries. I know there was Ezra, uh, Nehemiah, of course, giving the word of God, but then there were the elders uh, explaining that word. Yes, and we would ask you if you would consider being a Bible study group leader, like Bill Wilson, go where no one else wants to go, do what no one else wants to do, and you're going to see great success because God's word will touch people's lives and you will be able to use God's word to really help them. So write us today. We will make sure you get material called the encourager. This is only for those who lead Bible study groups, but write us today and get a Bible study group going in your home. The Quick Study Pocket Guide is a way you can begin to read the Bible cover to cover in one year. Why not join us? Quick Study is a print companion to this program. All we ask when you write for it is remember we're viewer supported. We need more help.